Hello everyone, I welcome you all to another video by Legacy IS where we are going to talk about the entire bedrock of India's democracy. How has India continued to be a successful democracy? Yes, there have been some issues on the way, there have been some roadblocks, some hurdles which we've had to cross, but overall we've managed to stay a democratic nation. It's because of a lot of factors put together, but one of the very, very important ones includes its elections. How our elections and the election process has continued to be one of the most robust, dynamic, inclusive, participatory, and something that has really given people a voice, which is essential for a democratic nation. And in this regard, of course, the role of election commission is most important. But as a combination of all of them, we have tried to maintain the system dynamic. The system which is adapting to the changes, the necessities, the requirements which the society is facing and having, and how those changes being incorporated in electoral reforms have made and continue to establish the entire election process, making it robust and standing still. It stands firm and defines India's democracy, and that's how it becomes one of the very important areas of a study and a very important area that requires attention for your UPSC preparation as well. So in this video today, we're going to talk about the electoral reforms which have taken place, the important ones, the process, the important ones which have been introduced, their repercussions. And today it is a result, today the election process that we see today is a result of this particular evolution. So we are essentially going to trace this evolution today. So I hope you enjoy the ride. Now, as far as the entire process of reform in India is concerned, it is related to a lot of, you know, recommendations and advices which are being given by several groups, think tanks and definitely committees. In this regard, we should be mentioning the role of some of the important committees which have been in place as far as elections are concerned. These include definitely your Joint Parliamentary Committee on Amendments uh, to Election Laws, J.S. Verma Committee, the Law Commission, but also Tarkunde Committee, Indrajit Gupta Committee, the Election Commission Report, the Election Commission of India Report of 2004, Dinesh Goswami Committee, the Law Commission of India, Virappa Moili Commission, the Vora Committee, the Venkatacharya Committee, again, very, very important relating to uh, the working of the Constitution and the Tanka Committee. We also have a lot of uh, inputs being given by civil society and judiciary from time and again. All of these have been incorporated and the, uh, the entire electoral process of India has seen some major reforms in this process. Our discussion today is going to focus on the changes which have been brought over the years and how they have made the system what we see today. So in this regard, if we start from our journey from and clubbing the entire electoral process together before 1996, we will see the first one and the most important one actually in this regard is how the 64th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1988 essentially reduced the voting age of the people who were eligible to vote. According to Universal Adult Franchise, today we are looking at 18 years plus age citizens of India eligible to vote. That was earlier 21 years of age after 1988, this particular Constitutional Amendment Act reduced this age to 18 years for eligibility to contesting, for eligibility to voting for elections to the Lok Sabha as well as assembly elections. So this particular voting age was lowered. Second, the entire process of elections is huge in terms of preparing electoral rolls, the electoral rolls, the superintendent's direction, command. It, in, it requires a lot of manpower to execute the different tasks. In this regard, election commission requires support of some staff, some manpower. And so in this regard, the staff engaged in the preparation, revision, correction of electoral rolls for the elections 
are deemed to be under the deputation of the election commission for the period of such employment so in this regard we are essentially meaning the fact that we are talking about some of the staff which the election commission requests the executive head of either the country as the president or the executive head of the state as the governor to actually provide with some staff that they can actually undertake the entire election commission process the entire election process so in this regard whatever staff has been deployed for any of these three processes those staff ultimately join the election commission or for that matter they are under the deputation of the election commission as staff of the election commission and are to function under their superintendence they are not really dependent to or obedient to the instructions at that point of time given by anyone else because they are under the supervision of the election commission now there are other important reforms which have been brought about with regards to the introduction of electronic voting machines they were used for the very first time in 1998 something which has become almost a normal today was actually not the same in 1998 when it was introduced on an experimental basis in some states of Rajasthan Madhya Pradesh and Delhi it started being completely used post 1999 in all the states of India also we have the issue whereby we have seen how booth was being captured and several ways through which the entire process of election was being tampered either manpower was being used muscle power was being used or money power was being used or ballot papers and the evm machines have been tampered there have been attempts whereby a provision was made the entire poll the entire election was basically going to be countermanded in the case of booth capturing that was something being looked upon through this particular electoral reform with regards to the voter id card that you have for elections an entire process of making the electoral process simple smoother and quicker was introduced by adding the photograph of the elector and this actually made the entire election system much more robust it addressed problems of booth capturing it addressed problems whereby uh, muscle power was being used in elections and this made the system very very strong so we were able to check all the bogus voting that used to take place that we could avoid impersonation of electors and this entire process of revamping this entire issuance of uh, photo ids to the people is actually a continuous process because every year obviously you have more and more people who are joining the electoral base they are turning 18 and becoming eligible to voting so this particular process was not a one day affair it is a yearly affair we also had the dinesh goswami committee talking about or asking to study the electoral system in detail and identifying what were the issues in this process so here few things we've identified whereby the candidates contesting the elections were to be classified into three categories whether the candidates were from recognized political party or registered unrecognized political parties or independent candidates now a major part of the election process of the election commission for that matter is where you have to really allow people standing and contesting for election so that part involves candidates also being categorized into the types of political parties recognized unrecognized or registered there is a very important element that is introduced as far as the electoral process is concerned that we should continue to respect our symbols we should continue as a part of the prevention of insults to national honor act we should basically do not and never insult our national flag our constitution our national anthem and we should continue this particular process and this is made a punishable offense it just kind of focuses our attention and ensures that we abide by this particular process we also had in the event where a person dies a candidate dies from a particular uh, just before the election election polling used to begin the election used to be countermanded and re-elections have essentially taken place this particular element was changed whereby 
the entire elections will not be no longer countermanded. It involves a lot of time, money and energy and it was just decided not to cancel the entire election. However, some safeguards have been provided, but altogether the provision of cancellation was being removed. Also, there have been issues with regards to how by-elections have to be taken place. According to the constitution or according to the different laws that have been framed, we have a buffer of six months in the event that there is a vacancy in either the House of the Parliament or the state legislature. But this particular element was decided that it was not to be applicable in two cases at a time when the remainder period of the member whose vacancy has to be filled is less than one year. So we can basically manage because we understand that election, conducting election is a time consuming and is economically burdening. So it often can, you know, lead to a lot of wasteful expenditure also. So in that sense, it was decided not to hold elections for those if the time period is less than one year. Also, when the election commission is held in consultation with the central government, the central government mentions or the election commission mentions that it is difficult to hold election. That is also the time in spite of the vacancy, we cannot hold the election any further. So that creates also uh, the two cases whereby you actually, in spite of the time limit, we are not holding the election for those particular vacancies. Now, if we look at the contestants, basically people who are contesting the election from two constituencies, okay? So, you are not eligible to contest from more than two parliamentary constituencies at a general election or a by-election. This was essential because you just wanted to stop people from contesting through unlimited constituencies, especially if it is a national election. So, here we are just this particular restriction has basically gone a long way in the way in which parties and political parties and their nominations are being regulated. We also have to reduce and as a constant endeavor have to use muscle power during elections. So arms are not allowed within the range, within the radius of polling stations and it is a punishable offense with imprisonment up to two years or fine or both. And obviously your license is taken away. The entire campaign period, which was basically earlier, much more now, it's been reduced where the minimum gap between the last date for the withdrawal of the candidature and the polling date has been reduced from 20 to 14 days. So almost a week, we are actually looking at this particular entire campaigning period being reduced. The entire uh, staff which has been used Okay, provision was made whereby employees of local authorities, the different government agencies, they can be used, they can be requisitioned and they can be used for the election process uh, so that you need not always go to the central government and ask, you can use people from these government organizations or government aided institutions to help and support during the election process. This particular element of voting through postal ballot again was something which has uh, stood till today and it has been one of the most successful ways in which India conducts its elections. So any class of person who is notified by the election commission can give their votes by postal ballot. So here when we have the system of postal ballot, not necessarily do you have to be present physically, you can be away from the country, you can be away from your constituency yet be eligible through postal ballot to give your vote. It is a process whereby we are just trying to ensure that the element of democracy is maintained, how we are coming up with new and newer ways of ensuring that this right of democracy, this right of rather participating in elections is something which is the primacy in India. Also, we have the option whereby if you're not there, you can even vote through someone, through a proxy. All right. So here we have the option whereby particularly the people from the armed forces are the ones who can vote on behalf. Some people can vote on behalf of the armed forces. Now, besides muscle power, money power is also a very big problem, which is playing a major role as far as the election process is concerned. So as far as parties are concerned, they are entitled to accept contribution all right, from any person 
or company other than the government they have to report any contribution which is being made in excess of 20000 so it is about a limit that is being put and it is also about awareness it is about tracking the source of the money where it is coming from and where it is going so that is just keeping a check on the amount of money that is circulating during elections one again very important part which was being done to ensure free and fair elections is that we have proper candidates sitting in the legislature of the country or the state for that matter so every candidate basically who has to who is uh, contesting for the election and is filing a nomination paper has to go through or some important questions whether he has been convicted or acquitted or discharged of any criminal offence, whether there has been an imprisonment or fine that has been levelled. Moreover, prior to six months of nomination, whether the candidate has been accused of any offence that is basically punishable. So we are trying to look into the prior criminal records of the candidates so that clean and properly moral candidates actually come into the democratic system of the country. This particular entire nomination questions include telling us about the assets that you hold, not just you but also the spouse, also the liabilities if there are any and the education qualification. So these additional questions are helping the electors, helping the people who are uh, helping the voters basically know their candidates much better and able to make a much more judicious decision as to who should ideally represent them. Now, there have been some changes with regards to the way in which representation in the Rajya Sabha takes place. Rajya Sabha, which is a body which represents the federal character of the country, you need not have any further domicile or residency requirement in order to contest for election. You can basically be from any other state besides the state you will be representing and you can contest your election. This was a major change which kind of uh, changed the system in which uh, the way in which Rajya Sabha was basically representing the different states. Moreover, open ballot system is basically showing the candidate who you have voted for. This is also a change which was brought from the secret ballot system during the Rajya Sabha elections. The entire ruckus happens on electronic media with regards to how this entire fight goes on with regards to elections so the campaign time and the time which has been given in the electronic media has basically uh, been fixed and now the election commission is the one who has taken up additional responsibility to allocate and equitably divide time in the uh, television media based on the past performance of that particular party and that time is the one that they have to stick to and uh, fix and they cannot go unnecessarily. So they, this time fixation is what has to be utilized by them individually. We also have very sensitive features introduced towards the disabled community by introducing braille features in the EVM. So that we are trying to be more inclusive in our approach, more participatory and how visually impaired voters can also cast their vote with the help of an attendant. Now, this is also a process whereby which is making or expanding our systems of democracy, uh, democracy making it much more robust and particular election of 2009 was the one from where we actually have these braille features being introduced to all EVMs through the electronic voting machines. There have been several instances where one constitutional body like the election commission and the other constitutional body like the judiciary has also intervened in several instances and come up sharing some of very important insights with regards to electoral reforms. Now in the Union of India versus Association of Democratic Reforms of 2002, we had the Supreme Court saying that contesting candidates need to disclose all their assets, liabilities and criminal convictions. In Ramesh Dalal versus Union of India case of 2005, it said a legislator is disqualified from contesting elections if on the day he or she stands convicted in a court of law. So we are looking at money power being curtailed or and 
muscle power also being curtailed. In the Lily Thomas versus Union of India case, we had the nature of disqualification for being a member of the house. So according to Article 101 Clause 3 and 190 Clause 3, a person can be immediately disqualified without any further hearing or without any immediate uh, additional requisition that is required. In People's Union of Civil Liberties versus Union of India case, voters essentially enjoy the right to a negative vote. This is something which will come and introduce in the form of nota. None of the above. Then also with regards to the uh, television media is a process of or was the system of exit polls whereby it was almost like the television channels had taken upon themselves, the media had become the judge in terms of deciding who are the prospective candidates who can possibly win and that kind of also influenced the mandate, the, uh, the voting style of the people. That is something where a restriction has been imposed and the election commission and also the government has basically taken an initiative in this regard. Any violation of uh, this particular process is basically imprisonment up to two years or fine or even both. Now, there is also a, a, a ruling with regards to the time limit with regards to disqualification that takes place. Now, earlier there was basically a procedure with regards to disqualification. For the simplification of this procedure, any person found guilty of corrupt practices, for that a three-month time period has been provided within which the specified authority has to decide and has to let us know about the discrimination. The president has to intervene and then ultimately a call has to be taken. So there is a lot of vigilantism in terms of the way in which decision is taken, expedited decision has been taken with regards to how do you deal with those candidates who are disqualified. With regards to the enrollment in the electoral rolls, for online application, especially the way in which we have introduced e-governance and mobile governance, after consulting the Election Commission of India, the government has come up with electors amendment rules of 2013, under which a lot of provisions have been made with regards to which you can actually, how you can enroll yourself online from the comfort of your home through e-governance and register yourself as a voter in the constituency. As I was telling you about NOTA, it was a very phenomenal judgment that basically uh, was given by the Supreme Court with regards to the option of none of the above. This is an instance of judicial activism and not just uh, judicial review, whereby judiciary has also given some initiatives and according to these directions provided, the Election Commission has made the provision of providing in the ballot papers or the EVM this particular option of NOTA. So even if the number of the electors opting for this particular option is more, the candidate who secures the largest number of vote gets declared. Because obviously we don't want a constituency to be unrepresented. However, we have this feature which is expected to be treated as uh, indication or treated or should be regarded by the political parties as an indication that you should really have better candidates representing within your party. A very novel feature was also introduced to check the bogus voting which was going on to ensure that there is no tampering with the EVMs. We had the system of VVPAT whereby an independent system where you basically get a note get you get the information that you have voted to the right person your vote has gone to the right person so this was introduced in a phase manner to ensure free and fair elections a, a particular system whereby just a receipt is to let you know that you have your vote has actually gone to the person who you wanted to vote for so this basically vvpat has helped in the entire voter, the entire voter community to challenge his or her vote on the basis of the paper receipt. And you are having the presiding officer looked into it and noted at the time of voting. The accuracy of the voting system is basically ensured and tried to help in the manual counting of voting. This particular accuracy is further enhancing transparency in the entire election voting system. There is also efforts being made continuously to ensure that the rightful people come to power. In this regard, the Supreme Court held 
the judgment of the Patna High Court that if a person has no right to vote by reason of being being in jail or in police custody, that person should also not be qualified to contest for the elections. So it does not mean that you can do one and not do the other. It's almost like if that person has been found guilty, then that has to be respected. Also, by reason of prohibition of vote, whose name has been entered in the electoral roll shall not cease to be an elector. Moreover, if we are talking of the member of parliament or state legislature, he shall be disqualified only on the grounds if this person has been in jail or in custody. This particular rule applies only if you are basically following the first principle that you have been convicted and are in jail and in custody and you cannot contest the election. So this particular provision is again done to manage the act of criminalization in politics and how criminals are actually entering our legislature. Immediate disqualification of the convicted MPs and MLAs was introduced in 2013 and in this regard Section 8 Clause 4 of the RP Act of 18, 1951 allows basically convicted lawmakers for this breather of three month period for filing an appeal to the higher court. This particular ruling however cannot be done retrospectively. It is only for the upcoming judgments. We have also introduced a very important element whereby we can check the upper limit on which election expenditure can be used. The amount of money that is in circulation during election is actually quite a lot. So in terms of managing that, the central government has basically raised the maximum ceiling that is there, that is to be there on election expenditure. For so for Lok Sabha, the, especially for the bigger states, it is 70 lakhs. In the states and other union territories, it is 54 lakhs. So similarly, if you look at an assembly seat in the bigger state, it has been increased to 28 lakhs. And in other states, the smaller ones and the union territories, it is 20 lakhs. The introduction of photographs has actually gone a long way in, in trying to maintain and ensuring that the right person and every person rightfully gets their democratic right. So according to the order which came in 2015, the ballot papers and the EVMs would also carry the picture of the candidate so that you, you try to ensure that accidentally also, A, you don't vote for the wrong person and those who cannot read and still have some confusion with regards to the symbol an additional safeguard is being provided by providing the photograph of that particular candidate. So this is all to show that you are just trying to make the system more and more robust whatever loopholes you find in the way it is trying to be uh, improved uh, in this process. As a part of trying to maintain transparency in election funding we have basically introduced an electoral bond scheme, something very, very monumental, something that is expected to at least change the way in which funding takes place during elections. So this is important whereby in an attempt to try and cleanse the entire system of political sponsorship, an electoral bond has been introduced, which is designed to be basically like a P note, a promissory note, similar to a bank note, that is payable to the bearer on the demand and free of interest, all right? This is open for any citizen of India to purchase. And the only problem which, of course, the Supreme Court has come up with uh, sharing the concerns that how do you get to know the source of the funding? That is where, of course, uh, definitely a problem lies. But in terms of an attempt to trying to ensure some amount of transparency in this election funding, it is a major, major step. So in this regard, of course, this video has been too informative, too exhaustive. But then again, this evolution is important to help you understand and appreciate the present system that we have and how we've managed to make it so strong and robust and make it stand the test of time. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know by liking it and sharing it with your friends. Thank you so much.